All right, y'all. So this is a uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube. So anyone out there on YouTube, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. This is our Theory Friday that we hold every Friday here at Covalence for our full-time and part-time Catalyst students. This is a benefit of being, well, part of that program. Uh, I got asked a lovely question by one of our students here in DMs the other night about Redux and its use cases and like understanding what it means, but not really. Um, I don't know if that's the exact words that you said, but uh, I figured it would be a good chance to pop on here to record this content and give you all like a crash course in Redux. Uh, for the students that are here, if y'all have a question, legit, just try using the raise the hand feature reaction or whatever in um, Zoom, and I'll pause and happily answer your question. Or if you want to type it in like what Andrew did right there, or if you want to type it in chat, Andrew, I guess you'll kind of be like my chat mod as I go through this. If they have questions that you can answer in chat or get my attention if I happen to not notice because I kind of go <laughs> zone in on this here. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to be learning Redux. And while my recommendation for you guys and your projects is just use Redux Toolkit, it still has some technical, and I mean, no, forget it, not even technical. It has some vocabulary hurdles that you have to get over first. Uh, when I first graduated Covalence, Jesus, is it six years ago now? Holy Goodness. Yeah. Uh, I did the same thing. I saw... Redux as this special keyword that kept popping up after every React project. I found somebody that built a traditional uh, SNES style JRPG in React and Redux. And I was like, that's so cool. That's what I want to do. I'm going to figure out how to do this. And I failed miserably because the Redux part was just too technical for a fresh bootcamp grad. And looking back at it now, I'm like, it's so easy. How did I not get it? Which I think was like the entirety of my development career. And y'all probably experienced that as well. <laughs> So like I said, my recommendation is just use Redux Toolkit. It is Redux with a whole, batteries included, opinions already added for you of how it should be built, including middlewares to handle asynchronous logic, which you probably have a ton of, you know, building the projects that you're learning in our bootcamp, right? The full stack CRUD applications. From scratch, check out my other YouTube playlist if you're interested in watching me build it in real time. Uh, yeah, so Redux Toolkit is a simplified, opinionated, and batteries-included way to use Redux in your projects. But today, I'm going to be taking a step back and actually building it from total scratch in old-school, just vanilla-ass Redux without anything, uh, no crazy bells and whistles attached to it. We're going to keep it as simple as possible, and I feel like once I give you all the vocabulary to understand what's happening and the complementary code, as I describe that vocabulary, you'll guys will realize that it's really not that bad. So first and foremost, Redux is a state management tool for JavaScript. That's it. It has nothing to do with React, which is something that I just could not wrap my head around for some reason when I was a wee coder myself. I can't say younger because I'm in my 30s and I'm not really young, you know? <laughs> yes, I know, Andrew. I dropped a, a profanity in like the first 10 minutes so the YouTube algo is not going to like this. But... <laughs> No, nah, it was just the uh, hyphenation. Oh, the, yeah. Where you hyphenate vanilla ass redux? Is yeah, it vanilla, vanilla dash ass, ass or is it ass dash redux, right? Vanilla ass redux. I, I like how we told Jackson, like, I'll keep it professional and drop an ass in the first 10 minutes. Perfect. That's that's my hashtag professionalism. But y'all seen my curriculum videos are the same way where I'm, I'm like, get in the comments when I do something stupid on the camera. I've got a it's <sighs> kind of got a, a, a thousand megahertz like beep. So <laughs> I can use some post processing on this. There you go. Um, yeah, so Redux is a state management tool for JavaScript. It has nothing to do with React. That's it. Because state is, <laughs> didn't even notice, yeah. Um, state is a, uh, it's a, it's a concept that simply describes exactly like, I mean, I hate using a word in its own definition, but it's it describes the state of the application you're looking at because y'all have learned through vanilla DOM manipulation and jQuery manipulation, which is just, what well, you know, shorthanded vanilla DOM that a lot of vanilla DOM eventually brought it back over going, oh, that's pretty cool what jQuery is doing over there. Let's just add it to our core API now. <laughs> Um, and then you all saw how we use it in React. But like thinking back to something like just my type or tic-tac-toe, in those labs, you still had variables that track the state of the game. How many moves has this player made? How many mistakes have they made while playing just my type? Um, whose turn is it in uh, tic-tac-toe? Is the game over a true or false Boolean, right? These are all stateful values. Y'all were using them, even though we didn't call it that back at that part of the course, because again, y'all were still new and learning 
basics of JavaScript. So there was no point in throwing on advanced terms like state. But again, it simply describes the state of the application as it should be. And whether that ties into the DOM or not doesn't really matter, right? Because the DOM is just like the visual representation of it, but the state is just JavaScript code. It's a collection of variables. And more than likely, as y'all can imagine, in a complex application, your state is going to be, well, probably a bunch of objects nested with other objects, right? Because a whole like object property tree is going to be the best way to describe a whole ass state of an application. <laughs> so that's what we're going to be building towards and trying to figure out. And I'm going to start finally by writing some code. Uh, let's see. Does that screen share appearing all right, Andrew? It is. Okay. So I am here in Commander. Again, this will be your terminal on your Mac. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, again, this will be uploaded. So if you're attempting to try and follow along with code, don't get stressed out if you fall behind because this will be uploaded and played uh, and uploaded and be rewatchable for YouTube. So don't stress too much about trying to follow along. I, if anything, I would even recommend taking some basic notes on some of the terms I throw out here in just a moment. But we're going to start literally from scratch. And this is not even anything React oriented right now because I want to make sure that you all understand that, that you don't have to have React to use Redux. Uh, in the description of this YouTube video, I will also link a code pen that I made for, I want to say Eric, a long time ago, a long time ago, meaning a few months, but it feels like an ages ago, where I actually built the core tic-tac-toe lab that y'all did in the bootcamp prep work using Redux to manage the state of the thing. Was it total overkill? Hell yes, it was, but dang, is it cool. And it makes me make, makes me look like I know what I'm doing. So we are starting with a very simple directory, Redux from scratch, where you need to turn this into, surprise, a node application. So I'll do my npm init, and rather than answer the questions individually, I'm going to pass the y flag. So it just auto answers yes in my package JSON for all those basic properties. Now, in order to actually use Redux, we got to bring in, well, Redux, right? That kind of makes sense. <laughs> we're going to install Redux as a package to this project because that's what we're here to learn. And depending on how long I ramble about this trash, uh, we'll see if I have time to quickly add React to it and tie it all together so you can see how it's done. I mean, that's my goal, but if we got to do it at part two, we'll tantalize people that way saying, you know, sub to our YouTube channel if you're interested for part two, where we actually combine it with React somewhere. But yeah, that's it. I've... I have a node project, a node project. I didn't say no project, a node project. I've installed Redux, and now we got to start writing some code and goofing with it. So I'm going to touch a new file. We'll call it, I'll call it Redux for now, even though that's not a terrific file name, which I'll get into. Which I know why it's not a terrific file name for later, but for now, that's what we're going to be messing with. So I'm going to open up the code editor, and we're going to get underway to show you all how simple it actually is to understand this stuff when we break it down to this core just JavaScript code, OK? So because I don't have any kind of transpiling with Babel, I don't have any compiling with TypeScript, I'm, keep, I'm keeping I keep this as simple as possible. So I'm staying in chill, chill vanilla JavaScript without trying to overcomplicate it in any step of the way. So because we are in vanilla JavaScript without any transpiling or compiling, right? I have to use what's called common JS, which y'all know as we call it the old busted require statements. But again, it's it's the old tried and true. If, if your import statements aren't working the way you think they are in a TypeScript project, I think Andrew and I both advised, just drop it down to require. It'll work, but you won't get any TypeScript support, right? So yeah, which I know sometimes, oh, Go ahead. Yeah, which sometimes like libraries will break their own typings, like a mailgun oh, famous. Bro, <laughs> that was so annoying dealing with the broken typings and the mailgun versioning. My God, I need to reshoot that just because it's been clarified finally, you well, know, they've since fixed it. But honestly, I think the type of inferences are probably best in the event they break it again in the future, just so, you know, we're future compatible. Yeah, I, I've gotten pretty good at messing with not only type guards, but assertions by just doing as X, as X, as X on like several lines of code just to force it into what I want it to be. And I've gotten I've gotten pretty good at that. But yeah, OK, so, uh, well, you know what? Like, what, what do we even need from Redux? You don't even know. I mean, I was about to write code because this is what I this is what I would do because I know what I'm doing. But I realized you don't know what I'm even trying to import or why I would have to import it. Right. Because I don't have anything I can actually build with Redux yet. So. Like I've been saying, it is a JavaScript state management library. That's it. And it works on 
two fundamental concepts. First and foremost, it is built off of something called reducers. Okay, it's a fancy term. Uh, again, I always joke that uh, developers just like to provide themselves job security. So when they build these libraries, they typically like to make up terms for all the special things that are they are doing that somehow wind up just being functions, which surprise. Anyone want to guess what a reducer is? It's just a function. That's all it is. <laughs> That's it. It's a job. It's a function. We've written them a gorillion times in our curriculum at this point, you know, like y'all wrote your first one. I think it was, is that, it was either say hello or check age back in JavaScript kitchen sink. If you remember that lab, which for my students here, um, y'all take the time and students out there, especially like any catalyst or alumni that are watching this, go look at your JavaScript kitchen sink lab at how maybe difficult that felt figuring out some of those simple lab steps like write a function called check age that takes a name and an age and look back at how easy that seems now you know it's a, it's a great journey to look back at that core lab and go wow that stuff felt hard and now look where i am it's yeah it, it's killer perspective you look back at something you wrote like three months ago and you're like wow yeah i was an idiot <laughs> I still do that now, by the way. Yes. It's something you never <laughs> that never changes. A developer. <laughs> Some things never change, you know? Okay. So like I was saying, reducers are just functions. And again, once you understand this, I'll bring it back to Redux here momentarily. Reducers are just functions, but they're special kinds of functions. They're functions that are, take two arguments. Okay. The current state of the application and an action that dictates how the state is going to change. Okay? That's all reducers are. And I was kind of getting to the point of saying they're a special kind of function. This is another term that's just general coding term, not a Redux term at all. Neither is reducer. Reducer doesn't, is not just a Redux term. It's a, it's a function. Okay. It's a function that takes two arguments, state and action. Reducers are a type of function called a pure function. Okay, A pure function is a function that runs, that given the same inputs, you always get the same outputs, right? There's no randomization. And it's a function that has no side effects. So given the same inputs... Same outputs. Also, no side effects. What do I mean by side effects? If I had a function that was meant to add two to any value you give it, if it also, for example, hold on. So this is a pure function. Every time I put in a value of four, I will get back six, right? It doesn't magically give me an eight on an input value of four when I call this function. It always does the same thing, same input, same output. That's a pure function. It also doesn't run any side effects. Like it doesn't, for some reason, in tandem, run a fetch request before it resolves and then returns the value to you. That's a side effect. That's something else happening in this function that could be isolated somewhere, that could be moved somewhere else and not actually uh, break the functionality of this pure example function, right? This is no longer a pure function because it runs a side effect in tandem to its core purpose of adding two to an input number. This would also be a side effect. For example, uh, changing the value of a variable from outside this function's scope. This is no longer a pure function because it does a side effect, meaning it tra it, it uh, reassigns a Boolean value to an, a variable outside of its scope. That's a side effect, right? That means this is no longer a pure function. Uh, a dead, dead ass giveaway that you don't have a pure function is if you can call it and not care about its return value, because that means it's, it's clearly doing side effects that have nothing to do. So if I see function calls like this across a project, I know they're probably not pure functions and they're probably doing something on variables or making side requests to other things and things like that. But if you actually care to 
capture a variable out of it, a return value, then chances are you're running something more pure. But again, this is just a, this is a term, a term, like a, a, this terminology should be aware of in general coding as we build our way towards what the heck does this have to do with Redux? So that's what pure functions are, okay? So given same inputs, whether they are no inputs, maybe this just returns true every single time. This is the dumb function, but technically it's true. For the same input, you get the same output every single time. And it runs no side effects, hence it is pure. Why is this an important concept for me to bring to you guys? Because reducers are an extension of pure functions. So we know that this thing, given the same application state, given the same kind of action, should always return the same output. It wouldn't make sense if our state tree radically changed in structure or value given the same action, right? That wouldn't make sense if I told the state to increment by one that it did it by three that time. That's why it's important to understand pure functions because reducers must be pure, okay? So like I said, uh, the function reducer is a pure function that will take the same two inputs, the current state, an action that describes how to change that state. We'll get to that one in a moment. And its return value should always be a new state. That's what a reducer is going to return. And that new state should be consistent every single time you call the same kind of action to make sure it remains pure and it doesn't have any side effects. No weird fetch requests, aka asynchronous logic, which is, again, why you have to have middlewares for Redux to do asynchronous logic. And it should also, um, yeah, like no side effects, meaning if, I, if I'm changing the state of count, it shouldn't be changing four or five other states elsewhere. Uh, you can do that, but I don't recommend doing it because you're going to find yourself in a debug hellhole. If you have like one state change, all of a sudden affecting six others that are tangential, you're better off just individually changing them one by one and not from one reducer, but that will make more sense as I keep going here. Okay. So reducers and pure functions. Reducers are pure functions. So what does your typical reducer code look like? Like I said, it needs to return a new state somehow, right? And it could be as simple as this. Like you could have const initial state. No, yeah, const a new state. You can make it a copy of the state you pass in. Uh, let's say the action is to increment our number by one, which I can't do that with a const. So if this is a, just a number of state, that's all it is, not an object or an array or anything. If the action is increment state, and for now, we're going to assume that an action is a string value that tells us what to do or how we're changing. It describes how I want to change my state. This says increment state count or something like that. Dumb on the nose, I know. So increment the state by one, and it returns our new state out of this function. Okay for us. And that right there is as, as simple as reducer can be. We pass in an action to describe how to uh, update our state. We write a conditional to say, hey, if that action tells us to increment, then increment our state and return it so we can now tell our application to update with that new state. As you can see, this has a lot of downfalls considering that that action is not this exact string. We're going to have problems already. So you know what? It's probably a good idea to say if no action is passed in, maybe we just return the state that was passed in completely unmodified as a fail safe, a backup, if you will, like a redundancy saying, hey, if we somehow call this reducer without the correct kind of action, let's just have it return an unmodified state to us. I mean, that, that kind of makes sense, hopefully, yeah? Um. So, you know, they're, like this this is really not a good reducer, but it does get the job done. So I've been saying to this point, what if the action is just a string? And I've been I've described the action a couple of times now saying it describes the changes we want to make. So is it just a string value? It can be if you're writing it all from scratch, but typically it's not. Typically actions... are objects. So a freaking set of curly braces. That's it, right? Like this is, again, 
I told you this is more of a vocabulary terminology battle than it actually is a code battle, right? Because the code so far has been remarkably simple, hopefully. <laughs> but again, actions are objects, okay? And they're objects that have typically two properties. Now, again, if we're writing this from complete scratch, we can call it whatever the heck we want. If you're working with RTK, you got to follow the conventions. But here's the conventions. An action is an object that describes the changes to state. And they have two properties, type, which is a string, and then an optional property called a payload, which can literally be any data type you want. So I know I kind of mixed in some TypeScript here with this, uh, with this typing, this interface, this type, if you will. But that's what actions are. They are objects that have a type property. There will be a string value that describe the changes to state we wish to make. And then sometimes we carry information in to our reducer via this action to say, hey, update using this value. Maybe we pass in and how much, instead of incrementing by one, maybe we pass in an action payload of how much you want to increment by, thereby customizing this thing a little bit further. So now knowing that, here's some changes we can make. The action comparison we're making right here, if string value action equals uh, increment state count. Well, we know that's not going to be the case because we can't compare an object to a string anymore, but we do have this convenient type property. That is why you'll see action.type commonly written across all Redux documents and RTK documentation as well. That's where the action type comes from. Now, we're not using a payload, and I did say it's an optional property, so we don't have to deal with it whatsoever. But that's that right there is as, in, is as simple as it needs to be. This is actually a more solid reducer. Well, let's add a new action type this reducer can handle. So if I can increment state by one and return a new state out of that, theoretically, I can also do the opposite, which would be adding an else if that says if the action type is decrement state count by one, we can then just do the following. New state minus minus return new state. There we go. Oh, there we go. Had an extra curly brace there. And there you go. That is a, this is how a reducer can now start handling multiple types of actions, right? We simply need to now daisy chain a new else if onto all of these. But you typically don't see this in React or any kind of Redux document. I don't I don't know why I just said React. Scratch that. That's why you don't see this in any kind of Redux documentation, right, y'all? You never see if else is because, well, again, technically they have to run a comparison for each of these. So this this is an equation, not an equation, but a uh, what's the term I'm looking for? This comparison is an operation that has to happen every time, right? And the comparison is always going to be a, to a string type. So it's never going to have to actually compare different kinds of values. So it's actually a cleaner syntax rather than daisy chaining else ifs, which again, when you're talking about potentially like dozens of actions, it can get kind of nasty to look code wise and technically uh, else ifs get less and less optimized the more you add on to a chain, right? Uh, there's actually a better syntax that you're going to see for this kind of comparison. Rather than comparing a string value to a string value, we're gonna be using a switch statement, which will take what we have written here and convert it to a statement that will look like this, right? So we're not, there's no need to run a comparison of data types across all of these because we're always gonna have the action type as a string and all we have to do is provide cases for it to find. So I think we've talked about the switch once in the curriculum somewhere near the beginning, I believe, and then you never actually use one unless Andrew, you have any switch statements you've seen across student labs recently at all or no? I'm trying to think of where we might have something with like nested conditionals. I don't think there's yeah. like a lab that really justifies their use. A switch, yeah. I, I can't think of, I don't remember, I remember talking about it when I was a student at Covalence uh, and then never actually needing to use one until I learned Redux. And again, I felt overwhelmed by reducers and actions and their terminology to let alone learning what us, you know, utilizing the switch statement and why I use it this way. But okay, bear with me, y'all. Almost there. The switch key, this is 
the string value or number value because we're no longer making like comparisons, right? So if an else if change you will chains you will still need if you are writing logical code that needs to do like ranges of comparisons. If it's less than five, do this. Else if it's greater than five but less than ten, do this. Else do something else. You if you're running like range comparison of any kind, you'll still need else ifs, but switches are great for just one type of value, like a string having several possible cases. So our key for this switch will be whatever action type is incoming to this reducer. The case will be where we write increment state count. Okay. And now break statements, as you can see here, uh, Cases don't typically work off of curly brace syntax. I think they can, but they typically just work off of what are called breaks. The break says, hey, that's this is where this case's code ends. You could also do that with the return keyword since we're inside of a function, this reducer. So what I can say is new state plus plus return new state. And there you go. That is the same thing as that if statement we had set up a moment ago. So naturally, I can go ahead and write the next one as well. Decrement state count. New state. Minus minus. Return. New state. Cool. And then our default case kind of acts like our else statement to say, hey, if an, act, if an incorrect action type is passed in, we should have some logic to make sure that we return an unmodified copy of state to make sure our application doesn't magically break at this point. So you can see this is actually a fair bit nicer looking than daisy chained else if statements, especially when you have just, it's just less, less operators to look for our eyes to look at, less curly braces for our eyes to get look at. And that right there is a classic, classic, classic reducer. This also, you don't see all that often, uh, given that we've been messing with a number value of state, we could always just do the following. We could say just return what the state value is minus one, for example, or plus one. That could work as well because it will return a number. And this also won't be uh, modifying the state either because that's another important thing, right? Uh, state, as we know from my React content in the full stack curriculum, it is not to be modified directly, right? You never modify your state directly. You make a copy of it, modify the copy, and update state that way. Because again, if you modify the state, a variable outside of this function, it would no longer be a pure function and thus no longer a reducer. So keep that in mind, okay? That's what reducers and actions are. So a quick recap, reducer, it's a pure function that given the same inputs returns the same outputs. A reducer is a special kind of pure function that takes two args, state and action. The action is an object that typically has, that always has a type property of value string and an optional payload property, which we'll get to in our demonstration a little down the line. Okay. And the reducer always returns a new state and it never modifies the original state because that means it would no longer be a pure function. So that's what a reducer is. That's what an action is. How does this ultimately combine with Redux? This pattern of reducers will build your state tree. Okay. Well, what does our state currently look like? We haven't defined what it looks like yet. Well, we can make something like this. Just have it be a number value of one, but you're like, Luke, you can't, you can't make it a number variable of const because that means you can't modify it. But guess what? We're not actually modifying state, are we? Because if we were, this would no longer be a pure function and hence not a valid reducer anymore. So something you'll see commonly in reducers as well is what if we don't have a state initialized as of yet? It is always a good pattern to have an initial state and say default that as my state argument should one not be provided. This is a syntax you will see very commonly across vanilla Redux applications. Now granted, Redux, State trees typically are more complex than a simple number value, but I'm trying to keep it as low level as possible until we build this out a little bit further, okay? So, okay, all this crap is looking good so far. We got our initial state, 
Uh, we understand more about reducers and actions. We know why this is written here in case it's not provided on a, on a call we are initialized correctly. We have like almost like a fail safe backup. And it also helps us kind of describe what our state tree is going to look like to our application as we get there. So that's the relationship of reducers, actions, and states when it comes to all this stuff. Now, how does it come tying into Redux, right? So Redux is a way of combining multiple reducers into a single what's called store. And that store has a set of protocols for you to follow in order to update and read the state it has. Okay, so you're almost building a sandwich from the ground up. You will have like a lettuce reducer, a tomato reducer, a bread reducer, and a protein reducer. All those reducers combined build your sandwich store. And that is how Redux development works. You build individual slices of your state out, and then they will combine to build your whole application store state. Does that kind of make sense? Thumbs up in the chat if that analogy makes sense. Because like, I haven't built out like my global state here, and I'm not even thinking about what is my global state going to look like because that's not how Redux is built. We're, we're building simply slices of our state that will eventually combine into our global state that we can look at. Yeah, which I think is a pretty cool way to look at this. So with this all coded out, how do we actually combine this into Redux? Like, how do I tell Redux, hey, let's go ahead and build a JavaScript state store that starts with this number here. And maybe we'll put it inside of an object, well, because we kind of have to. <laughs> okay, so how do we do that? Well, there are two functions from the Redux code base that we're going to need to pull this off. So, hey, Redux, we are ready to get Reduxing here. We understand actions, we understand reducers, we understand how that ties in with an initial state value. We also now understand how individual slices of state are gonna get combined together to build our global store, our sandwich. We, we built out each individual state of our sandwich as a reducer, and then them combined together, build the entire sandwich. This is done via two functions, one called combine reducers. This is the function that takes all of our slices of state and combines them together to build the store. And the other function, so <laughs> uh, let's take a look at it. It's the, it's technically called create store, but as you can see, it's currently st stricken through, strike through. And there's another one hap that happens to be called down here, legacy underscore create store. So if we even look at the IntelliSense of create store, uh, the Redux library maintainers, which by the way, are the same people that wrote and maintain Redux toolkit because over the years of re maintaining Redux, they saw so many like YouTube videos, medium articles and projects that were not using Redux technically the way they intended. So like, all right, look dipshits, this is how you should use it. Hence why RTK was made. As a matter of fact, if you hang out in the React.js subreddit and you see anyone talking about Redux, one of the maintainers of both Redux and Redux toolkit regularly comment there. Right. So why is create store stricken through? That's because when they first wrote create store for Redux, it literally was like the barest of bare bones stores. No middlewares. Think of them as like plugins for your Redux store. Right. Uh, bare bones of bare bones, including not even like developer tool usage, which Andrew and I <laughs> remembered about earlier today when I was losing my mind on, on debugging a problem. So they say, hey, hey, this is way too low level. Just go use configure store from Redux toolkit instead. That's what it says right here. So this is deprecated, but they do have a legacy create store if you are a sadomasochist like myself and I want to build it from the ground up anyway, which we're going to be doing. So when I have legacy underscore create store, just Whenever you see like an article about old Redux, or let's say y'all graduate uh, and you get a awesome, your first gig as a React developer on some enterprise application that's been running for like four or five years already, and they have Redux, they're probably going to be using vanilla Redux and not Redux Toolkit just because of how new it is comparatively to Redux, right? So you will see old school create store in this old school syntax. They so all should be aware of it. So legacy underscore create score is just the way we're going to be using it and not using create store, even though I think it'll be fine either way. All right. Those are the two functions that we need 
to actually build out our store, okay? So how do we do that? Well, like I said, we have to combine all of our reducers. Right at the moment, I know we only have one, but we're still gonna combine all one reducer, right? Because we need to have a global store that it builds out of multiple slices, AKA reducers. So this is commonly called the root reducer, meaning, hey, I am all the small combined values to get this one root value. That's what we're going to think of it as. And that's the name there. That's the term that the Redux uh, documentation and, and people that run it and run and write this code use. It's called the root reducer. But again, it's a variable name. So we could use anything, for example, Andrew. Uh, any variable name at all? Instead of root reducer, we could call it what? Pizza, spaghetti. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just the variable name. But it's a common term that you're going to see called root reducer. And that is simple, simply a call to combine reducers, okay? Who at its simplest will take an object as its argument. And so when I said we have a global object state tree, that's it right there. These purple ass curly braces, that's your global state tree. So if we're gonna add our one simple reducer here that has the name reducer, which that's not a terrific name for it now that I'm looking at this here. So how about we call this the count reducer, right? Because it's dealing with, well, the count state. So in this object down here, as always, we can make up, it's an object. We can add whatever properties we want to it, Andrew, such as? Spaghetti. <laughs> Spaghetti, right? But that's not a great name in the long run here. So let's just call it, well, maybe count because that kind of makes sense. That's a good property name for our re reducer here, the count. And its value will be the function count reducer. So just a moment ago, I said, think of these purple curly braces as your global state for this, well, application we're building. So that if these purple curly braces are state, that's how we wind up with state.count when we have to reference this value at a later time. And for example, if this was the following, an object of value of uh, property pizza value one, that is how you now wind up with state.count.pizza. That's how you would drill down to that. But let's just go back it to be back for it to being a simple number. That way we can kind of keep our heads straight here. Okay, so state.count should ultimately get us a one when we finally build this thing out. So you're like, okay, Luke, I've combined, like if we had more, I've combined all my reducers that's now built my global store. How do I actually build the store? Well, it's very simple, thankfully. We have this function here called create store. And all we have to do is call it. And the return value will be our Redux, our configured Redux store. Now, this is as simple as it needs to be. You just pass the root reducer to create store and you're good to go. You will never see this in, I mean, configure store adds a whole bunch of extras, right? From Redux toolkit. But the legacy create store function from Redux, the old school way of doing it, you would then have to pass additional arguments for middlewares and enhancers. I'm not gonna get into that in this webinar that's out of the scope of learning the basics of Redux, but I do have a React course in Gravity. And if y'all are interested in it at all, this, this was not meant to be some whole sales pitch meeting for you guys. But if you're interested in my standalone React course, it takes what we did in the full stack course and I expand on it way further, including this Redux toolkit. Um, I talk about a little bit about MobX and other state management libraries. And I, dive, I do like deep dives and all these advanced things on React and everything it does. And if you're interested in that, uh, Jackson and I can get y'all 50% off code. So just DM me if you're interested in that and we can throw it your way. But yeah, uh, that's as simple as it needs to be here. We create the store with our combined reducers and now we have a store. How does that help us? Well, we have a set of protocols to deal with state because we know that because state cannot be modified directly, we have to be very careful in how we describe actions to update our state and how we update our state, right? It's just like, if we had like a bank that we were running, I doubt we would let our customers change the state of the bank by wandering behind the desk into the vault and grabbing their withdrawals by hand. That would lead to chaos very quickly, right? And because state 
has to be like immutable. That's the term I was looking for this whole time. I should have just asked one of y'all what it was. <laughs> because state is immutable, we can't modify it directly. We have to follow a specific set of rules, protocols to modify it in the same way that you can't just walk into a bank, into the vault, get your withdrawal, leave a thank you note with your withdrawal amount, and then, you know, leaving. That's not how it works. Did it just recognize my hand motion? Why does it have the hand thing on my profile? Do you see that? Interesting. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Andrew's trying to get it to recognize the AI hand gesture. So, we, you know, when you go to a bank, you have to typically fill out a slip that describes what your intention is with your account. You give it to uh, your teller, and then they go through a system to update the state of your account via the action you want to happen, right? Your, your withdrawal, your deposit slip is the action that you want to happen. And then the state changing is your, well, account values changing via that teller. You follow that, those, that protocol, those steps to, uh, to do that. And that is the same idea behind a Redux store. You can't just change your state all willy-nilly. You got to follow the protocol. You got to follow the procedure, which is the following. How do you read the state of the store? It is really quite simple. We're going to finally run some code here because I'm going to get a console log ready. And we're going to log store dot get state. That's how you read state. <laughs> That's it. That's literally all it is. Let's go take a look at it. In all of its beauty, all this work, we have finally done it, folks. We got an object to, to console log with a property of one or property of count value one. We have gotten the state of the store successfully, and we have done so through Redux protocol. Look at that. That is the global state of our application in action, folks. Beautiful stuff. Let's dispatch in action. I'm this hand raised in my thing is annoying me. I'm going to turn off recognize hand gestures. And is there a lower my hand button? Oh, it's a setting. Let me turn that on. You had it on? No, I said let me turn that on. Why is... Where's the lower my hand button? Lower hand. There we go. Cool. Four. Probably bothered no one, but it's bothering me. All right. Like I said, uh, all fine and dandy getting the state of the store to do something with here. What else can we do? Well, the store also has a function called dispatch. The dispatch function of a Redux store is how you tell it what action needs to happen to update your state. So as a function argument, well, dispatch is the protocol. Again, going to a bank, filling out a slip, describing what you want to have happen to your, uh, your account value, like withdrawal slip. You hand it to a teller and they dispatch that action on your account, right? That's the idea. So what is an action? It's an object. And it had one required property, if you recall, type, which had a string value. What is the string value? Well, it's got to match one of our action types over here. Let's just copy and paste it so I don't make a mistake. And voila, we have now dispatched an action that describes what changes we wish to make to our state. We follow the protocol, the procedure of the Redux store, right? And we have successfully updated the state. It's all synchronous. So this will still log count one. Then it will come and dispatch this action. So let's copy and paste our get state code. What did I just do? Oh my God. Uh, yeah. Let's copy that code and just rerun it after our action to see if it worked. And I just messed something up on the screen size. Come on. There we go. Hey, we did it. We have successfully updated the state of our store by following our procedure. So I was debating on how far in the weeds I want to get here because technically we have enough to start adding React and going along with it. And you guys are like, wait, what? That's it? Yeah, that's it, y'all. I mean, I, Justin, like I said, this was originally an idea you put in my head to do today. Uh, either you can type in chat or use voice if you'd like. I mean, does this clarify a lot of the fundamental stuff on Redux that might have seemed really fuzzy at first? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think... Uh... I think it was really like, I guess it was the structure, I guess just the flow of where everything was going yeah. and seeing where, like, We're, one of the key things you said was the the dispatch. This is your, this is where you do it. This is where you talk to yep. your store. Kind of was, I think um, I had some breakdowns on where, like, 
I guess the root reducer was communicating with the story. Mm -hmm. Okay, dope. Glad we've been covering that. You're going to see yep. it here as well as I begin to add more pieces to it. And I think you'll like it even further when I finally add it with React, which I might do as a speed run. So y'all aren't here for like two hours. But then again, you guys have been doing three Fridays with Andrew. So you know what they can be like sometimes, right? <laughs> you mean seven hours, right? <laughs> Man, I thought I was bad. Okay. All right. We've done some pretty cool shit, y'all. Not going to lie. Um, and again, it's so it's like so simple when you break it down to these fundamentals, which is why I was actually really proud of taking this approach in the my React course in Gravity of how I approach this. Which again, this is you're y'all are getting a very condensed, you know, one to two hour long crash course on this, where I think I have like 10 hours of video content alone on vanilla Redux to make sure that y'all know it inside and out, even if you're never gonna write it, because I recommend you use Redux toolkit. But if y'all happen to hop on a project that uses Redux, damn y'all know what you're doing right out of the gates which is awesome again and something more than i could say when i graduated and figured it out myself all righty then so this is all fine and dandy what else can we do right so like i said we've talked about that optional payload property on actions let's actually utilize one so let's say we have a new case we'll call it increment oh my god i can't type uh Thumbs up if y'all ever write a word over and over again and you begin to double guess yourself if you're saying it or writing it correctly. Like I have this issue with increment for some reason and I have it with restaurant too. Like if I write the word restaurant enough, I begin losing my mind and it looks wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I know, right? Okay, cool. Just making sure I'm not crazy. We're going to call this action increment state count by. And like its name implies, we're not going to just increment it by one or decrement it by one. We are going to return state incremented by the action dot payload value. That's what I meant by it's an optional property. It doesn't have to be there. And its data type is any because it could be a number, a Boolean, undefined null. Don't do those, but you, they can be uh, an object or an array. This is data. You pass them what the hell you want. So. Let's see the sucker in action. Uh, you know what? We also didn't test decrement. So let's go ahead and do that as well. Where I'm going to now decrement the state by one, which means if we log it again, we should get uh, back to one. Let's confirm decrement works. I'm not just blowing smoke up y'all's rear. Yeah, see, decrement it back by one. Now let's increment it by, let's say, three. So let's copy our store dispatch, our action type, increment Oh no, in, in increment, increment state count by. And again, if you're wondering, Luke, these look like ludicrous string types for actions because the chance of you typoing one of these string values is pretty dang high or forgetting the word by. Did I write increment or did I write increase? I can't remember. And you probably don't want to have to keep going back to your reducers. I will tackle that problem in a minute. If y'all began thinking by watching me typo it, you're like, that seems incredibly error prone. It is. <laughs> So we can now pass a payload property with a value I said of incremented by three. So if we get our state, it should now hopefully be four. And we've confirmed that we can now start passing in a description of the state change we want to see and some additional data of how that state change will happen. So this is this will describe what we're doing. And we can also pass in data that will inform that state how to update. So if I see four, I'm a happy person. There we go. Look at that. And like I said, it can be any structure you want. It doesn't have to be just a number. So let's make it a bit more complex. What if my payload is a freaking object with a property of value with a value number value of three? So action dot payload dot value is how you get that. And that's a more common approach you're going to see in larger scale Redux applications. The payload is typically, and as far as, as you all, as y'all can see, it's objects all the way down in coding. Because guess what? What do y'all think functions are in JavaScript? They're considered objects. So <laughs> they're first class objects. It's objects all the way down, folks. But yeah, that's the common pattern you will see in action payloads. They're typically objects with sub properties themselves. Hence, we get action.payload.value. But again, it could be anything, including what? Andrew, co-host. 
Spaghetti. Yeah, exactly. Spaghetti. <laughs> That'll never get old to me. It's like beating a dead horse at this point. Yeah, but there you go. That is the interaction of state and actions and reducers and the store. All right, we just follow a set of procedures in order to do so. Okay. Uh, yes, so I was alluding to these action type strings are insanely error prone and a dumb way to do things in the long run because the chances of you forgetting that you called it incre incre increase, increment, increase, what did I call it again? Was it Troubadour? I can't remember, right? Uh, no, that's a terrible way to do things. So instead of writing string multiple string values across our application, why don't we just have a single source of truth for this string value that we can export and import wherever you want in our app. So if we have to call increment state count by, we bring in that variable and reference that variable instead of typoing the string 10 different times until we realize what the, what the problem actually was. This is something else you see in traditional Redux called action types. Literally. Variables that tend to look like this. You might be wondering, but Luke, do they have to be uh, capital underscore or capital snake case, I think is the term for that? No, they don't have to be capital snake case like this. But again, they are string value constants that need to be referenced all across your application and potentially across multiple files. And again, typoing this, gorillion percent is going to happen. Importing a variable and letting IntelliSense autocomplete and tell you if you mess up the variable name, probably not going to have an error. So here's what we're going to do. Everywhere we see increment state count, we're going to replace it with our handy dandy variable to prevent that typo from happening. And there you go. Sometimes you see these action types in their own file. And that is an old school Redux pattern. But I would consider it a better pattern to have it in the same place that you're using it for the reducer. And if you export this action type out, you can import it wherever this code might be and just use that variable, right? Much, much easier and much, much way less error prone. Let's go ahead and do it for the other ones as well. Copy, paste. Now copy and paste my variable in place of increment count by, uh, increment count by, there we go. Now let's do the third one. There we go. And then our final replacement for our reducer switch cases and our action type to make sure that no mistake happens. All right, y'all. Uh, again, that doesn't change the code at all, does it? It runs the same way, but we took the time to use these action type variables because it helps prevent massive amounts of errors that you're going to have to debug across your application. And these also kind of seem like a mouthful. And now as you're looking at it, it doesn't really matter what they say anymore because the variables are kind of a better indicator anyway. These just need to be unique values across your state trees, across your multiple types of reducers to make sure they're not like bumping heads somehow. So this is not a common pattern you're going to see writing like descriptive like sentence style strings. What you'll typically see is the name of the reducer it corresponds to and an action like that. This is a common pattern you will see in mostly Redux Toolkit just does this out of the box if you have any experience with that already. It has your state name and it does forward slash and whatever action type it got from your object that you that you called it, right? But yeah, this is this is a more common pattern you'll see. Name of the state this is this action is uh, goofing with and then a quick word or two about what its purpose is, right? So there we go. Huh? Oh, <laughs> There we go. Something like that. Those, those are much better string values for these variables. That way, when we eventually get into debugging Redux in the browser, we'll actually see this magic happening. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very simple idea. This It just helps prevent so, many, so much more errors from happening across your application than writing them by hand. 
and yeah, and as you can see, the, the actual string value just needs to be unique. It doesn't really matter what it says because we're now just using variables as representatives instead. Very cool. Now, here's something that you don't see in Redux Toolkit as much, but this is another old school pattern I want to introduce you all to. It's such overkill for the simplicity, but it is what it is. So there's actually another term that you'll see in Redux. Uh, us developers are hella lazy creatures. So we'll take the time to try and automate a five minute task by taking six days of like writing code and debugging to automate a process that we do in five minutes ourselves anyway. I mean, let's be real. That's what we do as developers, right? And then we spend, there's relevant XKCD for this. Then we spend more time debugging the code that automates the process and we've lost time to do anything else. Andrew will probably link that relevancy in chat. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah what do I, what, why am i alluding to that in the first place right i said that we're lazy creatures and we're er very error prone and we like to automate things where we can well writing curly braces and type and that variable name a snooze fest right so there's actually yet another function called the action creator so we'll do this actions Initial state, hopefully that makes sense. Reducer, that makes sense. I won't need to write additionals there. You will also have something called action creators in Redux projects. So again, like I said, this is more of a terminology battle than code because storing a string in a variable, I mean, that's not hard. <laughs> a function with two arguments, that's not bad. Switch statement, might be some new syntax you haven't used before, but again, think of it as like if, else, if, else, if, else, basically, right? updating state and not uh, mutating it directly. State plus one is not a direct mutation because it simply adds one to our current state and returns a new number. Uh, if I wrote state minus minus or plus plus here, those are operations that modify state. Be they would modify the original variable because remember, state plus plus is equivalent to writing that. And you're modifying state, which means it's no longer immutable, which means this is no longer a pure function, bad news bears, which is why I wrote plus one and minus one and not plus plus minus minus, okay? Remember that. Those are those shorthand operations are reassignments, which is bad. State is immutable. Anyway, uh, what the heck are action creators? <sighs> Again, they're just functions. <laughs> That's all it is. They're just functions. Uh, we give them a name, and the purpose of them, like like you're kind of maybe implying here, an action creator creates this action. So I'm gonna copy this action I have right here. Curly braces type increment underscore count. Copy it. And we're going to write a function called increment count. Uh, does this have a payload? No, therefore, it probably doesn't need any arguments. So empty arguments. And it's going to return that action. So guess what? That's an action creator. Why, why do this? Uh, well, imagine like in a large scale project, having to remember to write what the action type and payload and all that kind of stuff was. It gets kind of tedious. So having, again, a single source of truth of how this works is better. So I'm going to copy the increment count function and come down yonder and replace it. And voila, we now have an action creator in place of writing our actions ourselves. See that? Let's do the same thing for decrement. How about some shorthand here, folks? Because we're all about shorthand. We can change it to parentheses. Ditch the return keyword, move that inside the parentheses, and voila, <laughs> we have some Uber shorthand. Okay, let's do the same thing for decrement count. Okay, and then one more for increment by. Count by. Uh, again, this is a function arg. It could be anything, including what, Andrew? Pizza, maybe? Spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti. You're, you're, I'm the pizza guy, the spaghetti guy. It could be anything like pizza. It doesn't matter. But let's say, I mean, we're considering we're incrementing a count by something. I think num is a good argument for that. Uh, and we take a look at our reducer. Action payload dot value. Okay, so this is the number we're passing into the function, which means we got to set up our payload property on this action and a value property inside of that that will carry the num arg into the function or the action creator, right? So now we go down to increment by, 
Oh, this is now replaced by a call to decrement count. This is now replaced by a increment count by call, and we pass in the three like before. And once again, if I save the file and rerun it, it's the same output. But why did I go through all this mess? This is the pattern you will see emerge in vanilla Redux projects. Typically, you have an individual file for each reducer. You don't cram them all into one file. So I could have a count reducer, a theme reducer, a chirps reducer. Each one will be an individual file. Each file will have its actions defined in that file. The action creators that are exported out to use across your application. It will define its initialized state. You will write the reducer for that state in that file and export it out to combine into our store in a different file. This pattern of actions, action creators, the initial state for this state, and the reducer for this state are all organized in this fashion in a file is called the ducks pattern, as in keeping all your ducks in a row. Which, Justin, with RTK, you see how Create Slice automatically does this for you, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, the toolkit definitely uh, condenses a little bit of the yep. logic. Because that's what Create Slice is. Create mm -hmm. Slice is everything I've shown you right here, just highly automated for you. Those uh, object properties in your Create Slice in Reducer are these functions that you export out individually and then you dispatch them. That is where this pattern comes from. Because back in the day, sometimes you would see actions in their own folder, action creators in a separate folder, and then the reducers in their own folders and files, and it become a huge mess to try and debug them. So everyone yeah, started that moving. My, that was my first introduction to Redux. To see, Redux. and it, it, it was too ridiculous to get your mind around, right? It was overwhelming for sure. Yeah. But breaking down this way, not that bad, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Much, much, you can uh, see much more readable. Yeah, and you can see where that create slice function kind of rolled out of this, this exactly. pattern. So this is called the Redux ducks pattern. You can look it up, it's a real thing. <laughs> Keeping all your ducks in a row. Okay. Um, that's it for the crash course on Redux. There is plenty more I can show y'all, but in the interest of time, like I said, this is a crash course, right? And if there's interest, I'll keep doing these on multiple Fridays and expanding what I know. Um, yeah. So, uh, how does this actually combine with react? Well, I could copy and paste this code into a react application, but how about we build this shit out ourselves? Y'all I can do this. Okay. So how do we build react from scratch? Y'all have seen how I, how we have built the boilerplate using TypeScript. I don't have TypeScript here, so I'm not going to make it as complex as that, but we still need to have if we've written any kind of React code, y'all know that it requires importing files from one place to another, right? Uh, that is using a system called CommonJS, aka the require syntax. That this, if you ever see CommonJS, it's require. Um, but y'all know that I can't remember what it stands for, Andrew. ESM is it ex something module? Modules, I think. Oh, is it really? Yeah, ExaScript modules. If you ever see ESM, that's the import syntax y'all are used to writing in our TypeScript projects. And back in Create React app, y'all can write import statements despite it not being TypeScript. So we're gonna basically build the <laughs> babiest version of Create React app we possibly can, okay? Let's do it. So if, and here's the other thing, require and import, or well, require is not part of, uh, there is no browser support to my knowledge of common JS, right? You, you can't write, require statements in browsers commonly. I don't think so. Not without maybe some utility like browserify. Yeah. AKA a bundler. Um, yeah. And then import statements is not even universal in node yet. My God, it's so annoying. I really wish we just all moved to it and call it a day rather than having like ESM common JS. And there was another one like a ADM or something like that. I I'm UDM. I think that was it. Yeah, I, I hate that. That's my I always said that's my biggest gripe about Node is like there's no standard standardization for uh module support. Okay, so if browsers don't even have require, there's no hope of writing import statements like import app from dot dot slash app, like y'all are used to in Create React app and TypeScript projects. Uh it'd be how do we actually have that available in our code base? 
right? Well, we need something, a tool that can take all the files we've written and how they are required or imported and combine and bundle them into a single JS file keeping track of their dependencies. The tool that does this are called bundlers. For example, Andrew mentioned Browserify. Uh, and y'all know Webpack, right? The greatest, worst tool that I've ever had to deal with. It's awesome in what it can do, but my God, it sucks to write. <laughs> All right, so we're going to be using Webpack as our bundler because I already have my notes written down how it should look. That's why we're choosing that one. <laughs> uh, so next. Okay, but Luke, you're going to be writing JSX. That's also not browser-friendly code. It's, it it going to have no clue what the hell an H1 inside of JavaScript is without writing a create element first, right? So we're actually going to be using Babel as our code transpiler. Not compiler, it's different. We compile TypeScript, but fancy JavaScript such as import statements and require statements, JSX, those need to be translated in the coding world, that's called transpiled, into something the browser can actually understand. So Babel is a great tool for that. It allows us to write the latest and greatest ExmaScript JavaScripts, like all the newest and latest features, which TypeScript does that by default. <laughs> uh, it can take the hottest, newest JavaScript and transpile it into old, busted, boring browser code that we don't have to write. That's what it's going to be doing with our import statements and our JSX. It'll transpile it into safe browser uh, browser safe JavaScript that will run without any issues, right? So that's what it does. It's a transpiler. And obviously, we're also going to have to install React and React DOM and get this sucker up and running. So without further ado, let's blaze through this. I don't have to do this setup, but I'm choosing to. This will look very akin to what I taught y'all in the React part of our full stack course, where I make, I typically delete the public and source folders to remove them of all the bloat files that are in there, which are very useful for production, but not when you're just a newbie trying to learn how this works. So public and source, we've seen those before. As y'all can imagine, in the public folder, I'm going to make an index.html that will be our SPA. That's what React is. It's a single page application. We have one page, an index file, okay? And then inside of the source directory, I'm going to create two files our index entry point where we uh, import our whole ass application and render it, as well as a simple app dot. We'll do JS file. I'm not going to bother with X files because remember, JSX files are still JavaScript files. The extension JSX just kicks on certain additional IntelliSense features, but it functionally is no different than a JS file. Okay. So there's our app, there's our index entry point, and there's our single page we're gonna be loading into the browser, okay? Let's go ahead and scaffold those out since we know what they're supposed to look like fairly regularly. Our index HTML will be an exclamation point enter. From a scratch, we typically have a root div, but again, we can call it anything that we're writing it here, but I'm gonna call it root to be more pro, more professional. There's our Simple, common-looking index HTML. You notice here I don't have any. Unlike our TypeScript project, where we attach our app bundle from public JS app JS. If y'all notice that, we're not doing that here. I'll be doing it in a different fashion. I'll be doing it hot reloading. No, not hot reloading. Maybe it's hot reloading. Modular replacement. I don't know anymore. It's terms. Uh, app JS. Just simple. Doesn't need to be more complex than this. All right, that's going to be our app right there. Uh, and then our index entry point, we're going to write import React from React because we're going to be writing JSX here in a moment. I'll be importing React DOM from the newest version of React DOM, which you all know in version... Well, I don't have React installed yet, which would probably help. <laughs> React and React DOM, there we go. Let's go ahead and install those two packages. Uh, in version, I think it was... 17 or and higher or 18 and higher, they have a new React DOM import that comes from forward slash client that brings in, I think, V18 and all the newest features of V18 React DOM. So forward slash client, 
I'm not going to import my app yet, but I am going to write the following. React, the new React DOM client works with the following. You call a function called create root. This is going to be find the root in our index HTML, which will be get element by ID root. And then we target the root and say, render it to the root some JSX, please. Actually, what did I write in app.js? Do it ride good. So we'll do other oh, runs big. There we go. All right. That is our JSX. We have some files being imported here. How do we transpile and bundle all this together and add it to our browser running an index HTML? Because right now we cannot do that, right? Well, we're going to do that with Webpack. So we got to actually install some stuff here. We're going to write MPMI Webpack. Webpack is the well, the main core uh, logic of bundling. Webpack-CLI. Webpack CLI is the uh, command line interface of Webpack. It's what allows us to write scripts that include Webpack features, AKA if I wanna come up here and write something with Webpack in my scripts list here, Webpack CLI is the way to do that. Then we're gonna have Webpack dev server. So we're gonna tell Webpack dev server to locally run a server that will re that will help us refresh our React code whenever we save it and refresh the browser, right? So you don't see this on our full stack boilerplate because you don't wanna have the hassle at the moment of running two servers simultaneously talking to each other, right? We have the one server that just serves our React application in our full stack TypeScript boilerplate. So those are those three. Man, I uh, for the little video series I was doing mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube, I was having to manage uh, three servers simultaneously and kept screwing that up in the video. Ah, uh, two <laughs> client side apps and a, a back end, and it was a nightmare because I kept <laughs> getting them misplaced. What a nightmare! Indeed. Yeah. Sounds right. like production. So <laughs> yeah, right. All right, we got them installed. Let's go ahead and start building it out. How we tell how do we tell Webpack how we want things to happen? We do so via a webpack.config.js. How do I know that? It's from the documentation. Okay. So back in our code editor, we're not going to actually build out from scratch our webpack configuration. Uh, again, whenever you're dealing with any kind of pathings, it's always a good idea to get this ready. Just bring in the path module from node because we're in a node project anytime we have to resolve any kind of path names you all know that it's done via absolute path names which is a terrible idea for production so we're going to make sure that we're using that and now we're going to have one exported module from this file which is a giant configuration object that webpack will follow as surprise it's config hence why we get webpack config.js we have to tell it where does it start looking into this massive tree of linked files the, to bring them and all bundle them together, right? When I'm importing 15 different views and components from 15 different files and directories, where is the starting point of this whole ding dang mess? Source index.js. So that's called an entry. Path.join under underscore dir name. Source is the root. And inside of that, I want to find index.js. So it should resolve that path now as source index.js. Okay. That's all entry is. Uh, later on, when we're building the application, not just running it as a local development server, actually building it, like if I wanted to deploy this, maybe I will to GitHub pages, who knows? I need to tell it how to build it and where to output it. That is called the output property. It's going, to, it has several potential options. The only potential, the only option we care about here is the path of where to output and nothing else, which will be surprised when they're called a path join. And the root of this project, make a folder called dist and just bundle and paste everything out there. So it'll make a dist or distribution folder where it will build everything for browser ready. This is only used for production and has no real bearing on us in development, I'm fairly certain, okay? So one thing you should always include in your Webpack config, or you get a big fat error and it won't go away because I learned the hard way, is something called a mode. And we're not doing production ready stuff. So I'm just going to hardwire in development. Web the current Webpack v4 will get hella angry. 
if you don't include the mode, <laughs> which I learned the hard way. All right. That's what that is. All right. Next, during our Webpack dev server, how is it going to know to transpile and bundle all of our React and require and import statements? And how does it know to add that to our index HTML? Because I don't have a script tag here. We're going to have a plugin for Webpack that will dynamically insert that script tag for us into our index HTML without us having to write it during development. That's pretty nifty, right? And that is done via a plugin called HTML Webpack Plugin. <laughs> Very on the nose name there. This is a way, a rule of telling Webpack, hey, everything you've just bundled and transpiled, inject it as a script tag to the HTML file. Okay, so uh, we're gonna need to import that now. And the fact y'all see it uh, fully cased should tell y'all that it's surprise object oriented because it is, and not why it's not camel cased. Okay, so this is done via a plugins option of our uh, Webpack config. We're gonna say, hey, make a new HTML Webpack plugin. Uh, invoke that class. It takes an argument which will tell it where to find our index HTML should it need to find it. We'll do a path.join of under underscore dir name, source, no, public, right? Index HTML, index.html. And that right there is our Webpack plugin that once again will be dynamically injecting our transpiled bundled script of our React code into our index HTML, okay? So that's it. Next. Uh, we have, we're not actually transpiling shit yet, right? I mean, we're just having it generating an HTML file. Wh whoop de doo right? How does it know how to actually transpile our fancy ES6, ES, like our fancy ESM modules and how does it understand JSX and all that stuff? That's done through Babel. And specifically, I think it's Babel core. Again, how do I know that? I read the documentation earlier today. But this is the core transpiler of Babel at Babel forward slash core, Babel loader. Anytime you see dash loader, don't freak out about knowing what it's supposed to be doing. Typically it is a tool for Webpack to use in its bundling process. So Babel loader is just, hey Webpack, we're gonna be writing some rules for you to follow and we're gonna let you use Babel's features during the Webpack process. So think of anything time you see, see a dash loader, think of it as a bridge between like one library and Webpack. So Webpack can use it during its process. That's all anything you see dash loaders typically are. Which again, it's one of those things where like I when I fundamentally understood that it made some Webpack stuff just much easier to understand, right? So now we have to tell it a rule to say, hey, when you are looking through files in the source folder and you see these import statements and this JSX stuff and Webpack is going through this process, we need to tell Webpack what has to happen. How do you find these things and what rules to follow? It is done so via a property called module inside of which you'll have a set of rules to follow. And module means just like you thought, what kind of module system, common JS or ESM are we using? Okay, and how we're gonna find that. So we're gonna say, hey, anytime you run into the following file names, anytime you run into an extension that ends in JS, this is regular expression. Oh, this needs to be an object. I was like, what's wrong? There we go. Because you can have multiple sets of rules for different types of files. Each one is typically an object inside of an array. There we go. That's our test. We're looking for JS files with this regular expression. Uh, while it is bundling and doing all this crazy stuff and transpiling, we got to tell it, yo, dog, for the love of all that is holy. There. For the love of all that is holy, do not go into node modules and do that because y'all know how massive that folder is, right? And we're going to say, no, 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 no. We're not going in there and messing with all that. So make sure to ex exclude node modules from this particular thing. 
And then finally, we're going to say, hey, use the following loader to go through these JS files and figure out how they're going to be connected and how they can be bundled. And going through Babel loader, it says, hey, in this process, we can also use Babel and Babel core to transpile that stuff. Okay. But ultimately, Babel is just a transpiler, right? We need to tell it what to transpile. We haven't told it what it's transpiling yet. Again, think of it, we've installed like a chassis, but we haven't actually added either a ICE or EV engine, right? As an in internal combustion engine, that was redundant. Right? Like the, the point is like we've in, we have like a framework, but we haven't filled in the guts yet with Babel Core. So I'm gonna now install the rules it's gonna follow to trans and what it's going to be transpiling in this project. It has presets, preset ENV. I forget what it stands for, but it's for transpiling 2015 ES 2015 and further syntax. It's like the it's like 2015 and latest JavaScript syntax. It will recognize and transpile. And also we gotta tell it that hey, we're also transpiling JSX style React code. Hence why I have an H1 inside of my JavaScript code, and everything should be transpiled just fine with this new installation. Okay. So those are our two presets for trans for telling Babel how and what we're transpiling. Uh, this can be done via two methods, three methods, a Babel RC file, a Babel config.json, or by adding it as some options into our Webpack configurer. -er -er -er. So underneath this loader property, we can say, hey, I need some additional options. And here's some presets you're gonna be using during the transpiling process. Now. Y'all here and everyone in YouTube, do I expect y'all to know and memorize this? Hell no. This is, I'm just trying to give y'all some clarity into this whole process and not as an expectation for y'all to learn it and memorize it because you can just look up documentation and figure it out anyway. But at least here, hopefully some parts of the confusing webpack syntax are being slowly demystified, right? I hope that's the case. So we'll say we're, we're doing our latest and greatest JavaScript, ExmaScript tricks and techniques. And also we have some React JSX that you'll have to look at and transpile successfully. Cool. And yeah, that should be what we need for our Webpack configuration. And again, hopefully it's less scary than it used to be. And again, I haven't tied this back to Redux yet, have I? I haven't gotten there yet. Oh boy. Let's have some scripts now to actually build this sucker. We're going to have one for devving by saying Webpack serve. And we'll have one for building if we wanted to take this to production, which we're not, but it would look like Webpack, which is exactly the build script y'all add to your full stack projects. Just say, hey, Webpack, build and output as I've coded you to do so and where to do so. Webpack serve is our Webpack dev server kicking on and automatically loading up localhost colon 8080. That's what Webpack will default to and automatically refresh, I believe, when I change my app bundle, aka my React code. Okay, so that should be it to at least get React up and running. Let's check it out. NPM run dev. Oh yeah, look at that folks, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so with all that in place, we now have this beautiful website. <laughs> and because I have uh, the moduling system taken care of via Webpack and Babel, I should now be able to come to my index entry point, finish writing import app from app, and now choosing to render my application by itself, like y'all would normally see. And look at that, automatic refresh as well. So yeah, we are good to go. Now, how does this all combine with Redux? Well, let's just take the code in Redux as I have it written. And I'm gonna to choose to paste it right here for now. As you can imagine, this is probably not a terrific idea. I'm gonna get rid of these console logs and dispatches. We don't need these anymore, right? But all that vanilla juicy actions, action types, action creators, initial state, reducer, combined reducers, and created store. Remember, that's all just JavaScript. It has nothing to do. and got nothing to do with no React at the moment because you can use Redux in other applications outside of React. We are gonna go ahead and update this syntax. 
So we can have our nice import syntax again. There we go. Now, how does all of this Redux stuff actually combine with React at the end of the day if it's nothing, if it's just a JavaScript state management library? Well, that is one final installation, which is React Redux. This is a library that bridges the gap from a JavaScript state management library into a React application. This is the bridge that ties those two worlds together. Surprise, surprise. Let's get back up and running. Cool. And now, how do we bridge them together? So now that we have React Redux ready to go, we have a few imports that we can use from it. The main way to do this is, again, Redux is meant to act as a global state management solution for React projects. So we need to have a global provider of this state to our React application. It is a React JSX component whose sole purpose is to wrap your whole ass application and provide the store as a way to get state and to dispatch state updates that is done via a prop called store whose value needs to be your combined reducers and created store. And there you go. We now have global app, global state available for our application. So let's head to the app. No tricks up my sleeve, no prop drills. I have no sleeves anyway, so I don't know why I'm pretending to look up my sleeves. Um, how do we render state from the store? How do we subscribe to a part of state to listen for changes? Because that's also the beauty of a Redux, I'm going to close that, close these files out. That's the beauty of a Redux store, by the way, is that if we have a big complex state tree, we can tell our components to not update on any change, but only update if the count changes. Okay, that's also something that the React context API, if you ever see a YouTube article or video, article, YouTube article, Luke, YouTube video or a medium or stack overflow post that says, yeah, you can just use the use reducer hook with the use context hook and boom, you've got Redux. Nah, context re-renders all children. But again, should our whole application re-render every single component? Should it, every single component re-render if the count goes from one to two? Hell no. So we actually subscribe to small parts of our state in the store to listen to for state changes. I'll tell you what that is in just a moment. Because before, we would use what to look at states? We would just, well, import the store and run store.getState. To do that in a React application, we do it with a hook brought in from the React Redux library called use selector. And a selector is exactly what I was alluding to just a moment ago. We do not, again, if there were 15 other like if there were like 15 other pieces of state in this tree, one of these changing should not trigger our whole application to re-render. So this is what I meant by being able to subscribe to a smallest piece possible piece of state to listen to for changes that will trigger this component to re-render. So here's how that syntax looks. Use selector. Use selector takes a uh, a function as its argument. So you, sometimes you might see this syntax. The argument of this function is the global state of our Redux store. Everything combined together. And then we write, we return the smallest piece we care to listen to which in our case is what? State, our only choice, which is state dot count. So I return the count portion of the state. That way, if I start adding more reducers, if they change state, it won't trigger this one to re-render. Okay. And because this now represents a count value, we can call that variable a count value like that. That's a doable thing you could do. Uh, you typically won't see this syntax, though. You will see what, typically? A arrow function. So we're going to ditch the uh, function syntax. 
A single argument in arrow functions means drop the parentheses. And you can do an implicit one line return by dropping the curly braces, dropping the keyword return, and moving it all to one line. A common syntax you will see in selectors. Now, if you're wondering, this is just a function, right? So theoretically, could we do the following? Yes, right? We could absolutely write an arrow function that we export out here and import elsewhere. So you write import count selector and replace it here. That's in more advanced React pro or Redux, React Redux projects. I think that's overkill for one this size. But when you need like extreme selections of like very complex state selections and things like that, you will typically have them in that Redux file like this as selectors that you export out. But this is easy enough. And if we've wired everything up correctly, we are now reading global state. And again, this could be pizza component that is 15 elements down in the render tree. Doesn't matter. We bring in new selector. We select the piece of state we're, we wish to subscribe to to listen to changes for, and then we can do what we want with it. Use effects, render it in your return statements, use it in logic, whatever you want. Let's update our state. Remember, the whole purpose of the Redux store is that it gives us very specific protocol to follow in order to update that state. So let's add a, another div. Dang it, no autocomplete since it's not in JSX. Let's add a button. Increment by one, decrement by one. And how do we do this? There's another handy dandy hook called use dispatch that looks like the following. It brings us the dispatch coded function from the Redux store, and that's it. So now I can say on these on clicks, on click equals curly braces, after the click occurs, call dispatch. Now we have to tell it what actions are gonna happen. Actions are just objects that have a type and payload. Wait a minute, I have action creators for this. Hopefully I don't cause some weird like fuck. Uh, hopefully I don't cause some weird like uh, what's it called? Loop of uh, imports of import. yeah. because index is importing app and app is importing index. This is, this, this is a circular import that could implode this thing. But you know what? I'm willing to take that risk. Are you? Are y'all willing to take that risk too? We'll do it live. We'll do it live. Uh, <laughs> We had the three, I had increment, count, decrement, count, and I'll go ahead and do increment count by. There we go. Okay, so dispatch, increment count, dispatch, decrement count. And because this is subscribed to the state count, we've selected the state dot count as the count value variable. It should reflect that via state changes. And would you look at that? We did it. Uh, in a large scale application, you can have, and I recommend you do multiple use selectors to subscribe to multiple individual or grouped pieces of state. So you don't have, you, you're not limited to one selector per component. This dispatch does not have to be in a, a component that also selects. You can, you can call use dispatch in a button component that will simply dispatch an action and call it a day and not subscribe to any state changes. So they're not intrinsically tied together in the use for this, in the same component. Now, just because we have global state does not mean we have lost the use of local state. For example, I don't see a reason to have a form in global state, <laughs> right? Uh, when it can be handled locally and sent as data to our Redux state. What I mean by that is... We can have a locally controlled a local and state controlled uh, React input via the rules you all already know. Via U state. So nothing's changed here. Like that. Okay. Which means I can now add my third button. Increment count by, and 
Remember, all inputs are treated, values are treated as strings. So for the love of all that is holy, do not accidentally do string concatenation in JavaScript. And we're going to call the number typecaster on our input value to make sure we pass it the number we have in the input and not the string, because it could theoretically uh, take the number, let's say our state is five and I pass it a five from the input, it'll convert it to a string and we'll get 55 <laughs> instead of 10. So always make sure your types are accounted for. Increment by and whatever our current value in the input is for the button text. Okay, let's see if it works. <laughs> what did I do? Input value. I have an on chain channeler, val, set val. Increment by val is the text, number, val. That shouldn't be firing until I click the button, though, so I don't see why that would be an issue. Am I missing something obvious, y'all? Did you just save between reloads, maybe? I, I may that's have. That's why it saved like the. No. Am I missing something that painfully obvious? Undefined. State oh, something. God, God. It's value. No. <laughs> 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 <Good. laughs> Laugh it up. All right. Check it out. We have a local state that can now inform a global state change via an action payload. And there you go. We did it. Finally, let's see what the real power of Awesome Redux is. You can download and install a Redux dev tool extension for Chrome, and nothing's here. That is because, remember how I talked about how Create Store is very, very, very low level? I weren't kidding. It ain't got shit all added to it, which again, my React course goes into way further detail, but for now, we're going to speed line, we're going to speed run this. I'm going to add a second arg here as I think it's called an enhancer. And I'm going to say, look in the window to see if there is a installed extension called Redux DevTools extension. If that extension is installed is a truthy value then invoke that as a function to enable the dev tools to run. I think it is confoundingly stupid that this is not just part of the create store function, which is again why they ultimately deprecated it and said, don't use it, go to Redux Toolkit and use configure store instead, because it has this and several other middlewares that again, my React course will explain already added in the background for you. So refresh it and what do we see? We have a picture of our state. We have a chart of how our state looks like. And we have a tree of what it looks like if it was more complex. I can now trigger actions that will be logged by the Redux store because if we're following a protocol, back to that bank analogy, there's going to be a log of what our teller received and what it sent out from the vault of our bank, of our withdrawals and our deposits. So we could go through a log of every action of state changes done across our application, look at the state at that time, look at the action that triggered it, look at what the, the tree looks like, look at it, what the raw values are as it's happening. And there's our action type, right? And our action payload. How cool is that? And so now what we can also do is... Uh, look what this is. We can actually rewind state changes and fast forward state changes to help debug applications to see what happened and where. So the rewind tool is super cool. I honestly think that's like my favorite part of Redux is just using the dev tools and being able yep. to debug the history of state changes. So here's something else we'll typically see. A directory sometimes called store. There'll be an index.js in there that we'll simply have, again, because back in the day, back in the day where creating a store and configuring it and configuring it with tons of middlewares and whatnot would mean that we would have a very complex created store with many function calls and daisy chained arrays of middlewares to add features to our otherwise very simple store. That's why a lot of times in a pattern, in old Redux patterns, you'll see an individual store file because it gets way more complex than this. 
And instead of having it written here, you would simply import it and use it. So I will say like this, and that way this code is removed and you simply add it as a prop to the provider that way, right? So what did I, wasn't that like? Oh, root reducer, yeah. So root reducer also not commonly written here. A lot of the times you will have a folder called reducers inside of which you will have an index.js file that will be our root reducer call. Redux. I don't have this file yet, but we'll say import count reducer from the count file because each part of your state, AKA each reducer will be housed in its own file. Hence why I was talking about that all your ducks in a row pattern. Root reducer is now nuked. I have to add it back to my store. Right from the index file of my root reducers directory of my reducers directory. Uh, the action types, the action creators, and the initial state of my count piece of state are now all ducks in a row, right? They are all added here. Uh, named exports for your action creators, default export for your reducer. This is an actual pattern that you need to follow for Redux Toolkit and the ducks pattern in vanilla Redux. Named individual exports for your creators, and your default export must be your root reducer or your, your reducer for this piece of state, this slice of state. Hence again, Justin, where the create slice name comes from. You're creating a slice of state that combines later. That import count reducer comes here, combines reducers in reducers index. It's exported out. It's the combined root reducers are added to our store. And our index file for React Redux commonly looks like this. Import the provider, import your configured and combined store. And then I need to now update my import statements here for these, right? Because they are no longer from index. They are from up one reducers. No, this directory reducers and specifically the count file. And there you go. We are back. And that is the common pattern you will see in Redux applications. And there you go. That's it for today. What do y'all think? Any follow-ups? No, man. Thanks for going through that. That was a lot of clarification on little odds and ends that were confusing me. Um, yeah. <laughs> kind of where state was being set, where it was going to, and where it can be changed, and where it can't be changed. Correct. <clears throat> so, very uh, nice. I'm, glad, yeah. I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, I will also say, this is also the folder you'll see called features in Redux Toolkit. Features, count slice. And instead of writing all this, you just write, you know, const count slice equals create slice, export default count slice dot reducer. And then you would export the actions by their name down here as well, right? Got you. That's where all that comes from. Very similar to the... Uh... This, this yeah, is the pattern yeah, that spawn Redux Toolkit, yeah. It's a like query structure, kind of how you, kind of kind of a little bit, really just export defaults. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Well, my voice is hella dry, and I want to get ready to go to the gym, and Andrew's got to upload this so I can queue it up. Maybe I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it today, because I know what's his name. I think Jared was interested in doing this. Cool. Well, all right, y'all. Uh, if there's no follow-up questions from anybody, then I hope y'all have a <laughs> lovely, lovely weekend. Feel free to hit me up in the Catalyst channel in our Discord. Uh, YouTube viewers, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, obviously. If you like this kind of stuff and you're looking for more, uh, join our community. Check out the links in the description below for my React course or go to covalence.io to check out our full stack development course if you're interested in learning how to do that. Uh, if you sign up as a part-time or full-time Catalyst student, you get these kind of webinars for free every day. And on Fridays, custom ones like this, where you'll see me popping in more. And uh, yeah, if y'all got nothing else, uh, Andrew, if you want to stop the record, we are good to go.